due to the nature of this program. Listener aggression is advised. This is Chris Broderick. We the Fever 333. Hustlers Maximus from Guar. This is Eric from Necrogoblicon. Hey, this is Jamie from Bullet My Valentine. Hey, you got Dimebags Hack. I do a million interviews, and you guys know how to have fun. Hello, everybody. This is Jean Paul from the band Clutch. This is Blue with Philip H. Anselmo and the Illegals. What's up, guys? It's Dorothy. Hi, I'm Todd. And I'm Frank from Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. Hey, this is Tim from Dropkick Murphys. Hi, this is Joe from Dead. This is Tommy Vex from the Bad Wolves. This is Ivan from Disconnected. And and right now, you're listening to Honest. Hello, this is your close personal friend, Lou Brutus, and you are listening to Honest Brutality. And while you're listening, buy my fucking book, Sonic Warrior. Welcome to Honest Brutality. This is the show that is all things rock, metal, and stuff that doesn't suck. I'm your host, Evil, and I'm joined by my beautiful co-host. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Camera Rebel. And we have a special guest this yes, episode. We do. On the line, we have a gentleman who requires no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. This guy is a radio host with two shows syndicated on over 100 stations, photographer, comic book author, brewmaster, repeat radio contraband award winner, a vocalist of not one but two bands, and what I would like to call a rock and roll documentarian. He's done thousands and thousands of interviews, and not to mention one of my personal influences and heroes, Mr. Lou Brutus. Welcome to the show. There is no way I am ever going to live up to an introduction like that. So it's been great <laughs> being here. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are a busy fella. Yes. Uh, we, we were ships in the night almost earlier today. You're signing books as we speak, and that's one of the things we're here to talk about. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a surreal time for everybody. And uh, for me in the middle of it to, uh, to finally be getting the book out, it's just... You know, I, I don't know if I'm lucky enough to get another book out. Uh, you know, maybe that's the chapter title of the <laughs> the first entry in it. The time I released a rock and roll memoir in the middle of a pandemic. It's just, you know, it's just part and parcel of my life. I, I think anybody who reads the book um, will understand that, you know, I've seen some really cool stuff, some really weird things, some really... Uh, bizarre, fun stuff. But, uh, you know, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm doing this for a long time. I mean, I'm doing this since I'm a kid. So this is like 40 years. I'm in the rock and roll business around a lot of big bands and out on tours and uh, all these historic events. So I think if anybody does anything for 40 years, you're going to see some strange stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You're going to have some war stories. Yeah, yeah. I call it, yeah, yeah exactly. Rock and roll war stories. And, uh, you know, if you like, I'll, I'll just throw out some of the chapter titles. I would love that. Uh, yeah. To give people, yeah, yeah, give people an idea of some of the stuff in here. And the, the book, you know, it is a memoir, and uh, each chapter is a standalone story. So it's not like one continuous narrative. It would be like, you know, we're the three of us were standing around uh, at a bar talking about rock and roll and trading stories. And uh, so it jumps around a bit. But the opening chapter is the time I attended my first concert and threw up on Carlos Sanchez. Uh, and that's about <laughs> seeing Black Sabbath and Ted Nugent at Madison Square Garden. I had just turned 14 years old. Nice. I had the flu. Oh, I went anyway and uh, was so excited by being there that I downed an entire bottle of Boone's Farm strawberry oh. wine, passed oh, out, oh. missed Black Sabbath, and vomited on everybody. So <laughs> that, was my introduction. that was my introduction to the rock and roll world. And you kept going back. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I always loved music and always wanted to be involved in radio and, 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 you know, knew I wanted to be around music in some way, but I had absolutely no aptitude for it. You know, I, yeah. I, I picked up the bass guitar a couple of times and, and, you know, looked like I was having a seizure or something <laughs> each time I tried to play it. So, so that wasn't going to work out. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing, uh, DJs walk on stage at concerts, because I, I, I was a voracious concert attender by the, the time uh, I hit 15 years old uh, and was going to shows every week and, and growing up in central New Jersey an hour to New York, an hour to Philly, there were literally concerts every night of the week. Um, and uh, I would see DJs like Vince Skelza or 
Scott Muni of WNEWFM New York, uh, <laughs> who would walk on stage, MC the bands, and I thought, well, that guy doesn't play anything. Well, well, hell, I can do. I can introduce the bands, you know. <laughs> Heck yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, That's even a dumbass like me could do that. You found your spot. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that helped guide me. But uh, some of the other chapter titles are. Uh, the time I went to the Arctic and got in a mosh pit with a bunch of kids in polar bear fur while Metallica sang about sodomizing a goat. <laughs> uh, that's uh, going up to Tuk 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 to the Arctic with Metallica for the Molson Ice Polar Beach Party. There, there's one, and I haven't mentioned this one very often. It's it's not quite hard and heavy. Uh, the 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 artist who is sort of kind of sort of involved in this story, but it's it's so bizarre. Uh, the chapter is entitled. The time a pair of Dave Matthews band tickets helped helped me to learn sensitive military information inside the Situation Room of the White House. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. I was getting a pri- I was getting a private tour. I had a few family members with me, and uh, we were outside the Situation Room. And I said, "Oh man, I'd really love to see it. I know the history of it, Kennedy." Blah 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 blah. And uh, the the guy who uh, I I do not name in the chapter said, oh, well, hang on a second. He picks up a phone and he starts talking to somebody who I think was inside of the wall. <laughs> and uh, he said, hey, I got I got Lou Brutus out here. And uh, yeah, he's got some of his family with him. Oh, gee, uh, I don't know. Let me ask. And the, the guy covers up the phone and said, is the Dave Matthews band coming to town? And I said, yes. And I'd love to get tickets for you and all of your staff. And your chunk and the door opens up and I like, go into the situations room. And um, you can read more about it in the book about the, the particular military action, but it did come a couple of weeks later and I, I knew about it ahead of time. And I swear they would have killed me if I went on the air and said anything. <laughs> like these guys, they were, they were not messing around when I said, Hey, look, Kosovo is under one of those clocks. Isn't that the place where, Oh, and that's, that's where it cut off. So, uh, and, uh, you know, so, some of the other chapters are, uh, things like the time Dave Grohl proved himself the most down to earth rock star on the planet. Cause Dave Grohl, he is what you think he is. He's just, he's just super cool. Yeah. He's just a regular guy in a black t-shirt and he just happens to yeah. be one of the biggest yeah. rock stars on the planet. Uh, and I, and I, and I'm not one sure. of my heroes. Oh Yeah. And and listen, I, I've like interviewed the guy through the years. I, I, I'm not a friend of his or anything. I, I mean, I've I've just done my rock and roll stuff with him, but I've I've seen him operate a couple of times, including once, which is the particular story in the chapter. And uh, yeah, Dave Grohl is as super cool as you think he is. Awesome. Yeah. Hopefully, one of these days we'll get to meet him. He is definitely uh, an honest brutality favorite. Absolutely. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, uh, I, as, as best as I can tell, and again, I, I can't say that I really know the guy, but uh, from what I've seen, he's uh, he's the real deal when it comes to being, uh, you know, uh, a solid uh, human being besides being uh, uh, a crazy-ass rock star. So, uh, again, there's a couple of dozen uh, chapters in there, and, and there's just, you know, all this crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, we're talking about Dave Grohl here. I just really wish that more musicians kind of took on that genuine and just authentic, you know, kind of down thing. to earth, yeah. down to earth instead yeah. of being like, this is me. And yeah, I'm the greatest thing yeah. since peanut well, butter. I think that's like, what set Dave apart though, is the yeah. fact that he's one of the few that is that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I know what you're saying, but you know, it's not a business for shy people. Not, True. not normally, although mm-hmm. there are a lot of introverts um, and, and I think that's one of the, I'm no psychiatrist, so I'm just guessing here. I think that's <laughs> one of the reasons why people, people who do the rock star job can get a little, a little off center. Yeah. Um, I think artists in general, um, are sensitive to things in the world that maybe other folks are not sensitive to. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're their artistic sense gives them insight into things. I'm not saying it's better. It's just different from, from other folks. But I think that also uh, at times leaves them more open to uh, bad personality traits or yeah. uh, things that, that can, again, just sort of throw them off in life. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting group of people who, who go into entertainment uh, at all uh, but the the calling to be a rock star is, uh, you know, 
Um, it's a it's a weird thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a bizarre thing. It can be a terrifying thing. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, back to Dave. Yeah, Dave Grohl, as best as I can tell, has handled it at about as good as anybody else has. You know, yeah, so good sure. on him. So far, these chapters of your book, this sounds like a really fun time. So, uh, how many different stories are we looking for in this book? I mean, what are we talking about here? There's about uh, I, I think just shy of two dozen chapters. Um, some of the chapters are, are super short, you know, uh, and others are, uh, a bit longer and more involved. Uh, I think one of the longer ones is the one that goes last in the book. Uh, the chapter title is the time I rained vomit down upon the biggest concert in history. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's about covering live aid in Philadelphia. Ah. Uh, and, uh, I was working for a radio station in Philly at that point, And I, I, I think I was, I think I was still in, a teenager and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I end up backstage interviewing rock stars. And before I actually got there, um, I had, did two runs over the stadium. This was the old JFK stadium in South Philly, uh, in a helicopter, glass nose helicopter. On the first run, I got queasy and started barfing all over the inside of the helicopter, which <laughs> by the way, doesn't, doesn't make the, doesn't make the helicopter pilots very happy. So <laughs> there was a little sliding window on the, the, the door on my side. So I had to slide that open and stick my mouth out, which is all it was uh, uh, big enough for. And uh, I was vomiting down on, on live aid. <laughs> so there's like 120,000 people. Although it was such a hot day, by the by the time my vomit fell, you know, it was probably like slightly cool drops of moisture, which were actually a welcome relief to whoever, uh, whoever got hit. I can only hope, you know. <laughs> um, either, either that or dried uh, chunks of hard... <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, well, no, the rotor blades kind of mixed it up pretty good, you know, <laughs> so I, I don't think there was anything, I don't think there was anything too solid, I don't think there was any solid pieces of scrapple from my Philly breakfast that morning. Oh, uh, I suppose that um, the title of the book being Louvre Barfs Everywhere wouldn't be very appealing, so Sonic Warrior makes more sense. <laughs> well, actually, you know, the, the uh, d- technically the full title of the book is Sonic Warrior, my life is a rock and roll reprobate. Tales of sex, drugs, and vomiting at inopportune moments. <laughs> uh, so it's you know it's it's, it's in there. Life. It, it is what it claims to be. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and uh, Corey Taylor uh, from uh, Slipknot and Stone Sour was uh, uh, kind enough to uh, write the foreword for me, which is uh, uh, pretty funny. There's. Uh, there's a couple of chapters he's involved in, um, one of which uh, is entitled The Time Our Tour Bus Ran Over a Guy on the New Jersey Turnpike. Oh, God. And uh, I was uh, traveling with Stone Sour. We were, I forgot the name of the tour. Uh, Hailstorm was on the tour, uh, Art of Dying, and I want to say Theory of, oh, Skillet was on it, maybe Theory of a Dead Man anyway. Uh, I met up with a tour in New York. We went from New York to Bangor, Maine, Bangor, Maine to Connecticut. And, uh, after Connecticut, they were going to drop me at my uh, my office and studio in Washington, D.C. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, still in my bunk, and we weren't moving. And I thought, oh, I don't think I've slept long enough, but I, I guess we're here. And uh, I, I heard somebody moving outside the curtain of my bunk. And uh, I pulled the curtain back, and it's Jim Root. And uh, Jim was still in Stone Sour at that time, of course, still in uh, Slipknot and still one of the most amazing players on the planet. And, uh, uh, like, like, I'm all groggy, and I'm, hey, Jim, Jim, are we in D.C., man? Go, get my suitcase. Gra- grab my suitcase, man. I got to get off the bus. And uh, Jim, Jim looks at me and says, uh, actually, uh, Lou, uh, we're not in Washington. Uh, we just uh, ran over a guy in the New Jersey Turnpike, and we're blocking all of the southbound oh, lanes. Oh my god! And uh, <laughs> I looked at him and said, "What the fuck's wrong with you, man? That's not fucking cool. <laughs> Don't say shit like that." Can can now grab my fucking suitcase? I gotta get off the bus. And he said, "Now seriously, there's a New Jersey State Trooper in the front lounge. He's a really nice guy. Come out and meet him." <laughs> and uh, we we uh, we clipped a guy uh, who uh, had had. Um, gone a little crazy and, and we think he was trying to get hit, but he was out in the middle of traffic and Wade, uh, our bus driver did a phenomenal job in not running him over. 
uh, and the guy, we just bumped his shoulder, and then he rolled underneath our bus and refused to come out, and the troopers had to take him out, get him in an ambulance, and uh, we kind of lost track of him after that. But had he really been injured, uh, I, I, of course, would not have put the story in the book. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, so that was one story with Corey. The the other one, and and he's he's barely in that. Um, but um, one chapter that does sort of center on him is entitled "The Time I Escaped the Wisconsin State Police and Their Fake Phallus Felony Enforcement." <laughs> and uh, this is one of the longer chapters, but let me let me do my best to briefly encapsulate it. It was the closing night in America of the Subliminal Verses tour. And I had been with them uh, in California when they were recording the record uh, up in Laurel Canyon. Uh, so so I'd kind of been there through the, the whole process, and I'd been at a lot of the tour stops, and I thought, well, I should be at this gig. So uh, I surprised them, and uh, I showed up dressed as Hunter S. Thompson, uh, who was a, a favorite writer of mine, somebody I knew a little bit. There's actually a, a chapter about uh, my... Uh, small but crazy adventures with Hunter Thompson uh, uh, in the book. But anyway, I, I surprised the guys in the band, and uh, I'm going to emcee the show, and I'm dressed as Hunter, and oh, okay, we're going to have a big, goofy night. And uh, I'm back in Corey's dressing room with his wife at the time, uh, Scarlett, and uh, uh, she and I were talking, and Corey was behind a curtain, and I assume he's, he's getting dressed. You know, the opening band, Shadows Fall, was just going on at that point. And uh, finally, I hear behind me, Okay, Hunter, I'm ready. And I turn around, and, and, and there's Corey Taylor, and uh, he's in his slipknot mask. And other than that, he's not wearing a stitch of fucking clothing. <laughs> he, is, he is buck naked, except he has his junk wrapped up in, and, and again, I didn't want to stare, so I can't tell you exactly what it was wrapped in. <laughs> And I think I'm also trying to block much of it from my memory. But as best as I could tell, he had taken like a black plastic bag and shoved his junk in, maybe with a sock thrown in, because this thing looked like it was coming down to his knees. I don't know. Maybe it was non-meat filler. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But black plastic bag. And, and I think that there was like black duct tape wrapped around it. Oh, and I'm, I'm like... What? Uh, and uh, uh, he he puts a like a robe. Oh, and his hair was in pigtails. So he puts a robe on, and he said, "Let's go." And I went, "Go, go where?" <laughs> so Scarlett and I started to follow him, and we walk out of the dressing room, and, and we're walking through the the bowels of this arena, the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. And I love Matt. Madison is one of the great rock towns in all of uh, creation. Hmm. So anyway, we're walking through the arena. He's got this robe on, and, and we're following him, and we're, we're going God knows where. And then suddenly I realize, closing night of the tour, he is going to prank Shadow's Fall. And I'm like, this is going to be the greatest tour closing prank of all times. Because as you probably know, most nights, uh, most closing nights of a tour, the bands, they, they fuck with one another. Oh, yeah. They, they yeah. do stuff, you know. Right. So anyway, sure enough, we, we walk to the stage and we, we walk up the steps and we get to the side of the stage and Scarlett and I stop in our tracks. Corey keeps going and he walks to the center of the stage. Now there's 10, 12,000 people watching and shadows fall. They're, they're doing their big opening number. You know, they're playing their asses off. Corey walks to the center of the stage, parts the robe and poses <laughs> now, when I say he poses, the, have you ever seen Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. <laughs> he poses. He poses like the guy in front of the video camera, sort of up onto the balls of his feet, with with, and he's sort of like in this sort of model seductive pose, and then he parts the robe. <laughs> And out comes the giant duct tape weenie. <laughs> and it starts and it starts swaying back and forth. And then Corey I wouldn't say he was jumping around, it was more like he was prancing like a pony. <laughs> and, and the crowd is going bonkers. 
And the Shadows Fall guys, to their credit, didn't miss a fucking note. <laughs> I love that. So anyway, I'm <laughs> roaring, and I think this is like the greatest thing I'm ever going to see. And then suddenly, behind me, I hear Scarlet, Corey's wife, scream out, All right, Hunter, you're on. And she shoves me on stage out after him. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. I'm dressed as Hunter Thompson. I got the Hawaiian shirt. I got the glasses. I got the Las Vegas visor. I I have a fly swatter in my hand. So I start chasing Corey, swatting at, at the giant duct tape weenie, <laughs> chasing him around the band members. And and the the only thing I can think of at this moment is, thank God there's no photographers. And I look down and the photo pit is filled because it's the opening number. <laughs> yeah. And I can I, I, I can almost hear the clicks of the photos over the music. By the way, there are photos of this. It's graphic. No, they're not in the book. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I never come in contact with them, of course, but it was it was it it was nuts, uh, and and it seemed to go on for a long time. I, I I don't think I was out there longer than twenty or thirty seconds with him. And then he went to one side of the stage, I went to the other. Well, I don't know what happens to him when he goes off that side of the stage, but I run smack dab into two very displeased looking Wisconsin State Troopers. They're not happy. Oh, gosh. Oh. So I I did. I did the manly thing. I ran for my fucking life. <laughs> and I changed my clothes. I hit up um, the, my, uh, my, uh, uh, the affiliate for my syndicated show, uh, Hard Drive, Hard Drive XL, uh, WJJO. They had a luxury suite there that night. I ran up, locked myself in the, the private bathroom of the suite and refused to let anybody in. <laughs> and like, you know, they got a keg of beer in there. They're all ready to piss themselves. And I'm like, no fucking way. I'm not <laughs> opening up. And I changed And then I had to go back on stage. So I went to change the clothes and everything. I didn't get busted. I didn't get arrested on a, 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 a felony weenus rap or anything. Oh. Dear God, I, I came as close as you're going to come. And, and it, Believe it or not, it's even more detailed in the book. Oh, I love it. Um, but but uh, w- one thing I, I want to mention is, and and I swear to God, there's photos. If you see the photos, they'll they'll scar you for life. Uh, <laughs> you know that everybody listening is going to go look for those photos now, don't you? Oh hell yeah! Well, I can, you know I, I I give the name of the photographer in the book because I'm like, listen, it's like they're out there. Um, but one of the reasons they're not in the book. And I, I considered seeking permission to, to put uh, at least one of the pictures in. Um, there's so many stories, and, and they're from so many different years, and, and some are, are from like decades ago. There was no way I was going to be able to have a picture for every chapter, and that right. really bothered me. It yeah. really it really bugged me, uh, the lack of consistency. Yep. Um, so then I thought, oh, wait a minute, I'll call Alan. And oh, Alan yeah. uh, is Alan McBain. And anybody who find, I know you know who he is. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll mention for folks who don't. Absolutely. Uh, Alan is Alan is uh, uh, an incredible graphic artist, and he's a political cartoonist and an illustrator. And he and I have been working together thirty plus years. Yeah, he started. Uh, I, I met him through Frank Zappa's bodyguard. Chuck Ash, who I also explain about in the book. Chuck's a very old friend of mine. He introduced me to Alan. Um, and uh, I called Alan up and I said, hey, dude, I, I, I signed a book deal. I'm finally coming out with the book. He said, oh, finally. Because, uh, you know, I talked about doing a memoir for years. And uh, I said, listen, I, I'd like you to do a cha- uh, uh, an illustration for each chapter. Are you up to it? He said, send me a few sample chapters. Let me see what I can come up with. And uh, he sent me pencil sketches. And uh, one of the great things about Alan uh, is when he desires to be, when he, when he's working in that direction, uh, he is very mad magazine esque. And it's one of the things that he and I sort of befriended each other over Mm -hmm. uh was we we both loved a lot of the same bands he's a degenerate who fan by the way (laughs) i don't think he's missed a who tour in the united states since tommy that's crazy Uh, he's old he's older than me uh you know so he's been going to see the who i think since like 69 or 70 um so anyway uh uh 
he's contributed a uh, an illustration to each chapter. So when you turn the page, there's the illustration of the chapter, and uh, you know some of it involves me vomiting on people, and some of it involves. Corey Taylor with a fake schlong down to his knees, and uh, you know, in, in the style uh, of Mad Mag, well, his style, but with the the Mad yeah, Magazine yeah, flair, and, and, yeah, that's fantastic. The, yeah, yeah, where he jams in all these little extra things. One of the the really uh, cool illustrations is the one for uh, uh, Metallica up in the Arctic, because um, the Metallica guys are in there, and and some of the Inuit villagers, and uh, Courtney Love and I are down in the corner, kind of crawling. Uh, and there's also, for people who are, are super old listeners of mine, uh, they will actually remember uh, the character Sammy the Seal, oh, yeah. uh, which was a, uh, a talking alcoholic seal who smoked cigars, who was a character on my show. Uh, and, uh, he was in one of my early, uh, actually two, uh, two of my comic books that I put out, uh, radio promo comic books I put out through the years, uh, and uh, all and thought, oh, geez, you're up in the Arctic. You got to have a seal. We'll put Sammy back in there for fun. So, oh, yeah. Um, and, and one, uh, back to one thing that you, you guys had said earlier, you know, it, it is a fun book. It's, uh, you know, it's not a, I, I mean, there's, there's drugs in there, but there's, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about a tell all book where I'm trying to embarrass other people or right. anything. Yeah. If there's any stupidity going on, it's me. Yeah. You know, I don't mind embarrassing myself. Right. And Lord knows that through the years, I've seen plenty. If, if I had wanted to write a book where I, I saw so and so not with his wife, and I, I, I saw somebody else shooting up heroin and blah, blah, blah right. whatever the Yeah, the hell I could only imagine what you've seen. I mean, yeah, but I don't want to be an asshole, yeah, you know? No. So why would I put out a book like that? I've, yeah. I've, I've seen and been around enough cool, fun, awesome stuff that I can write a cool, yeah. fun, awesome That's book. So great. You and know? we need that. I don't right want to now. be a dick. You know, yeah. Lou, we, we really need that right now in our day and age. I, in fact, I'm hoping that this book, I know that you're probably having some of your, your dates, your signing dates and whatnot canceled due to all of the different things that are going on right now. But hopefully you'll be able to reschedule those and do them later on. I think people need a book like this right now. Yeah, they need something that's fun and it's a good time, a good read, something that's a, it's a break from what's going on around them and, and these fantastic stories with people they can relate to. You know, I'm really glad to hear you say that because even before the, the pandemic problem uh, popped up, you know, everybody was already at one another's throats. And yeah. um, it's, it's, it's not been uh, a good time for people's mental health of yeah. late. And uh, uh, that was one of my hopes for the book. Not that like, oh boy, I'm going to sell a million books and all that. But I just thought, well, whoever picks this up, I hope they get a good laugh out of it. I, I think they'll understand the rock and roll business and the radio business maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, not that there's any brilliant revelations. I, I think they'll understand really what the grind is like day to day. Uh, but if they're interested in music, I think they should find it interesting. But yeah, it's a, it's a quick read. It's a fun read. I, I, I think it's what people would consider a good summer read or a good bathroom reading book because most of the chapters are super short. You can blast through them. I know some folks who got advanced reader copies because uh, when the book is released, the release date is, of course, April 14th. Right. There is a recorded version of the book released the same day that I've narrated. It's a good seven and a half hours, I think, long. Um, but uh, the folks from the recorded books company were like, oh, my God, this is just what the world needs right now. I it's like it. it's not filled with politics and hate. It's filled with yep. music and rock and roll and good, stupid fun. And I'm like, you know, that really. And, and uh, again, to echo what you said, it's. I think it's really what the world, I think it needs it now even more with everything else going on. So, uh, so long as, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, when it bounces back and it will absolutely, uh, you know, I'll do the, the postponed dates. You know, we don't have the new dates yet because no one can say yet when the coast is going to be clear. Um, but I'm absolutely going to do it. And in the meantime, you know, uh, I can talk to folks like yourself about the book. Uh, the week uh, of the release, since I can't go out and do public readings, I'm going to do, uh, I'll be doing readings, uh, uh, you know, via my website and via my YouTube channel. And we'll do 
short little blasts on uh, TikTok and on my Instagram. And uh, there's a million ways I'm going to be able to present this to people. Yeah. You know, the actual in-person stuff was like the smallest aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so many of my radio affiliates are, are stepping up and interested in doing stuff. So, you know, I'll, I'll still be busy promoting the book. You know, it won't be, I won't be doing the in-person stuff right away. That That's the only uh, bummer part of it. But let me tell you something. If having to postpone some book dates is the biggest problem that I have to deal with through all of this, I'm going to consider myself one of the luckiest people on the planet. Yeah, I already consider yeah. myself one of the luckiest people on the planet. Uh, I've gotten to do uh, a whole lot of great stuff and meet a lot of interesting people. So I, please, I, I, I consider myself really fortunate, but I hope my luck continues to hold out, you know? We're all kind of the same age here, and and we've seen a lot of stuff in our lifetime, and we saw internet come to life, and then we saw it change and become this multifaceted and networking, and there's just like so many things going on that you can do on there. It's so wonderful that you have that tool at your, you know, your fingertips, really, uh, to be able to do that sort of stuff instead of going out in the public, which we can't, well, shouldn't at this point in time. In some places, you can't. Um, but to be able to present that to your audience as well, I just think that that's, that's just so amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I learn a lot from the bands. Um, you know, I, I tell anybody who's in media like me, uh, you know, you've got to sort of present yourself as an artist. And I don't consider myself an artist. Uh, you know, I don't consider myself a musician, although I sing in a couple of goofy bands. Um, but you know, you have to present yourself almost as pop art. You know, uh, I mentioned the who earlier, mm -hmm. you know, the who were great at not only doing, and, and I mentioned the who other people have done it since then. They were one of the first, um, they presented themselves not only as musicians, they presented themselves, everything had an artistic bent to it. And, and I, I try and do that myself. That that's why, you know, I've, I've learned photography and I've learned how to manipulate graphic arts and how, why I've worked with, uh, 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 Alan McBain and other great graphics people, you know, you can't, you know, I'm primarily a radio person and you can't just be on the radio. You, you've got to do other stuff to stand out and, and stand above. Right. Um, plus all that other stuff is fun. Like I, I consider it fun. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. you know, it's yeah. engaging and it helps your career, but it's also, you know, it's, it's great stuff to be able to do. I mean, I love being able to do photography. It, mm -hmm. It's what gives me a break from, uh, from the wicked world and, uh, and all of my work. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, there are times where I, I just loathe social media. Yeah. Uh, I think it's done damage to people's heads in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But, uh, it, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's kind of a necessary evil. And so long as you don't, take it seriously. Like I pop on, I post my stuff and I don't stare at political hashtags. It's just making yeah. people crazy and it's, yeah. it's hurting them physically and mentally. Um, and I'm not saying not to take the world seriously, but you can't, you can't just soak your brain up with that stuff. Yeah. It's not good. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there as a tool, uh, and as a, a bit of, fun and relief so long as you you know you do it in the right way like anything else you know All drinking is fun <laughs> yeah but if you drink 24 7 it's probably not a really good idea yeah. you know Fry your brain. Uh, oh now you tell me you know yeah. yeah 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 oh but trust me i mean there were days there were days back in the past where i could take a highball glass of jack daniels and go 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 down, but that's not really a talent that you want to have. No. So <laughs> no. For me, you know, I'm, I'm not totally, not totally a teetotaler anymore. You know, I might, I, th I think the only alcohol I've had the last year and a half, I had a couple of beers in Greensboro, North Carolina in December of last year after a five finger death punch show, I uh, was hanging out with a friend and went to some brew pub. But other than that, I don't think I've had alcohol in the last maybe year and a half. Yeah. I prefer, uh, and I don't smoke weed. I think people should be able to smoke all the weed they want. I don't smoke it myself. Um, but I don't do any drugs. I, other than caffeine, I drink black coffee. 
uh, and I listen to music that, and I take pictures. That's what I do for fun, you know. You know, Lou. Actually, uh, you had brought it up earlier. You do uh, concert photography, and you just brought it up again. You take pictures, and and you love that. So, my passion as well is concert photography. Hence the name Camera Rebel. Uh, play on words with the canon. In preparation of speaking with you today, I was kind of reflecting on my start in doing concerts and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I know that you've gone to a lot and you've shot a lot of shows and and I can't even tell you how many you've done, but I'm sure the number is staggering. I just was kind of wondering maybe if you could take me to the first show that you shot and just tell us what that was like for you. You know, I I, kind of slid into it um, because... You know, I'd been going for years backstage to interview bands. Mm-hmm. And, and some of the bands that I became friendlier with said, you know, hey, do you need a photo pass? Like, they would just offer me a photo pass. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, you know, I don't need a photo. You know, give it to somebody who can use it. You know, I, I, you know if you got an extra, I'll keep it as a souvenir because, you know, I'm, I'm a voracious collector of music memorabilia. Yeah. Um, but then I thought, you know what? And eh, maybe I'll start trying to take some pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I had started back in the mid-90s when I was living and working in Chicago uh, doing pictures. I got a a, a Canon Rebel film camera, like an actual film camera. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to take pictures of lighthouses, which I still do. That's one of the things that I really love to do uh, to relax is just go visit lighthouses uh, and, and photograph them. And and if you go to my website, there's a whole lighthouse section. And I've, I've shot hundreds of lighthouses. Um, so anyway, you know, uh, I remember going to shoot rancid. They were playing the black cat in DC and Laura said, Hey man, you got your camera, bring your camera. You shoot the whole show. We don't give a shit. Yeah. You're cool. Shoot the whole show. (laughs) And you know, I used a flash at first, which I did. I, I was a dumbass. I didn't know you were not supposed to use a flash. You know, uh, but the, the, the guys in Rancid, they're totally punk rock. They didn't give a fuck, right. you know. But, but you know, somebody finally elbowed me and said, dude, you're not supposed to use the flash. <laughs> then uh, I went to uh, Slipknot. They were, they were still in clubs. Mm. And uh, by then I had a, a Nikon, and it was my first, you know, sort of digital camera, I think it was a D50, and it was a nice little camera. It wasn't really good for shooting concerts because you can't shoot in low light like you need. But right. you know, once the light, if the lights were bright, you know, I might get a really good shot. And uh, it was right after that I, I sort of got lucky, and uh, somebody asked me if I was interested in shooting Major League Baseball and getting a, a, a photographer's pass and shooting from the field. And I was like, hell yeah! Right. Um, so I rented. I, I knew I needed better equipment, so I rented. Thank God for rentals. <laughs> yeah. They've saved me a couple times. Well, I'll tell you a story, too. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I after that, I was like, I really got to get more serious about this. So I went out and, and got two professional-grade Nikon cameras and pro- professional-grade lenses. And, uh, you know, it's taken off since there. Um, I, was, uh, I was in London, I guess it would be two summers ago now, Um, and, uh, I brought my smaller camera rig like I would for concerts, but when I landed in London, I found, I, I I had gotten an email while I was in on the plane, uh, from the Rolling Stones people. And they said, you know, Hey, you're welcome to shoot us, uh, at Twickenham stadium. Uh, Twickenham is the rugby stadium. It's one of the suburbs of London. And, uh, they, they sent me the particulars of shooting and I realized I was going to be pretty far back back by the, the sort of little mini stage that Mick runs out to. Mm-hmm. And I thought, damn, I don't have my big lens, which is a, a 300 millimeter, an F28 300 millimeter. It's, you know, for those of you who do not know photography, it's like one of those big bazooka-sized it's, lenses. They uh, and and it's bazooka. heavy. And I, I, it yeah. is heavy. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I thought, dang, I, I need my 300. And I found the one place in London that would rent it. Oh my god! And uh, I, I put down the whatever it was five thousand dollar deposit yeah. and uh, <laughs> and took it for the night. And thank God I did because I got really uh, awesome pictures of the Stones that night, uh, oh, which amazing. to date has been their last show in the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a you know when you need it, rent it. You know if you don't have it otherwise. Yeah. So what are your two uh, favorite lenses to have when you're shooting? 
Well, for concerts, uh, I, I shoot with a pair of uh, uh, Nikon D4S cameras, mm-hmm. and the two main lens I, uh, uh, lenses I tend to use, uh, both Nikon and F28 24 to 70 millimeter, and uh, a 28 70 to 200 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I will switch over to a semi fisheye 14 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's if under particular circumstances, or if it's a band who lets me shoot the entire set, like bands that I'm, I'm you know, right. are I'm fairly friendly with, like Slipknot or Cheap Trick or somebody like that will let me shoot the whole show. Then I'll, I'll start popping on different lenses and trying different things. But right. the real bread and butter lenses are the uh, the 24 to 70 and the yeah. 70 to those 200. Are, those are both of my go-tos. I always use the fish eye when yeah. I get to get in there because I can't mess that up very bad. Actually, we shot Guar together. That was that was hysterical. That was messy. Yes, yeah. it was messy. <laughs> but he he hadn't uh, he hadn't gotten in the pit with me very much. I've never shot Guar, but I, I've seen him, and I can't imagine that they, shoot they, back. they would be a yeah, I was going to say, they're not a lot of fun to be... Well, the, the worst ones for that uh, are ICP, the Insane Clown Posse. Oh, yeah. uh-huh. Those guys, those guys, if they even smell a camera lens, there's some Fago coming your way. <laughs> yeah. And the, 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 the last I saw them uh, was Rockfest in Kadot, Wisconsin, a couple of years back, which I go to MC, uh, and I, I do the... Jumbotron video interviews, and I do the radio interviews backstage, and then I shoot out of the photo pad, and the MC, like, it's a nonstop thing, and it's a lot of fun, and it's a great event. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope everything uh, comes off this year. Anyway, um, ICP was playing uh, one night, and I thought, well, let me try and get some pictures. And I, I, I literally, like, crept, snuck around the PA column, and I, I'm going to wait till they're on the other side of the stage, and I'm going to, like, sneak some photos so they don't cover me in Fago. Mm-hmm. Those bastards weren't even looking. And they no-looked me, like a, like a no-look basketball shot. Oh, they no. no-looked an entire bottle of Fago on me and soaked me in my lens. I was like, oh, no. bastards. <laughs> but I, 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 I had to respect the incredible shot that they did, and it was a no-look. <laughs> They just sensed I was there with a lens. I'm from across the stage. <laughs> it, was, it, it was, you know, again, I, I spent the next 45 minutes cleaning the outside of the lens. Uh, oh, and lucky wow. for me, I put, um, uh, I put like, uh, like rubber glove covering on, on my stuff yeah. because there's so many people throwing beers or drinks or, you know, right. in case you drop something, it helps absorb it. So, so it wasn't as disastrous for me as it would have been for somebody else. Lou, you've seen the shift in the music industry at large with the advent of the internet. We talked about that a little bit earlier. File sharing, streaming services, all of that. And it's been a part of what you've done as well. What do you think the future of the industry looks like? Specifically, do you think that you're going to see the death of the full-length albums that come out every few years in favor of the singles coming out one after another? You know, uh, well... You know, the way things are right now, uh, I, I kind of expected it to come. Uh, and and I, I, I was solving my questions going back five, ten years ago uh, with, gee, do you see it going to a model like bands did in the 1960s? And that was where, you know, even the Beatles, would they'd release a single. And they, they'd ride it to the top of the charts. And as that started, they'd release another single. And then another single, and then they might do a three or four song EP. And then when they had cobbled up together enough stuff for an album, they would put out an album. It really wasn't until really Sgt. Pepper, you could say Rubber Soul and Revolver, that they were really sort of concentrating on doing albums. Right. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I think it's cyclical. I think there's always going to be people who put out albums. But the way music is consumed anymore and people's attention spans, yeah. at least for the time being, are, are very much, you know, just about play me a song. Oh, Lady Gaga has a new song. Okay, I'm going to listen to her new song, you know. And, you know, so some folks have the attention of a gnat. You know, they, they're <laughs> just not going to sit through a, yeah. they're not going to sit through a 40 minute album. Right. Also, too, I think uh, maybe a tiny part of that is, you know, some folks come out with albums that are like 70 minutes long, which is great if you're a big fan, if you're a casual fan. You know, I know people who are just like, ah, oh, that album's too long. And when people would say that, I'd be like, what? 
<laughs> yeah, you're yeah. complaining that you're getting too much music for your yeah, money, but that's how some people feel. So, yeah. you yeah. know, so the short answer is, I, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and neither do we. We just we're seeing that shift here. What we do, yeah. you know, and we get asked that a lot by some of the up and coming artists we we talk to. Like, what do you guys think? And I'm like, I have no idea what to think of it anymore. I don't know how to even make sense of the industry as far as what's happening because we're just now starting to kind of figure out how people are consuming what's out there, you know, and how it's being delivered. Right. And I think that Lou hit it on the nose. It's we have a short attention span. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it's 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 just like anything else in life. It's just like life in general. You know, get up each morning, concentrate on what you're doing, do it as well as you can. Don't be a jerk to other people. And, uh, you know, time and talent will helpfully, uh, you know, work out for you. I mean, people often ask me, you know, what's, what's, you know, what's the secret? You know, I saw you on stage with Metallica on Facebook, or uh, I saw you were traveling with Slipknot, or I saw you were out on the road with Cheap Trick, or I saw, you know, you were interviewing the struts or, you know, all, all these bands and, you know, what's the secret? And I'm like, there is no secret. Right. There, I, if, if there was a secret, I swear to God, I was, I'd have sold it to everybody and gotten out of the business 30 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's no secret. There's uh, just, you know, try, try and, and do your best and, and hopefully you've got a, a, a knack for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, just respect everybody that you meet along the way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I always tell people just, just be nice to everybody, be professional, be on time. Don't get wasted. Don't drink. Don't do drugs, mm -hmm. especially when you're working, right. you're there to work. You're not there to, to be Keith Richards in 1972. <laughs> right. You know, it's just not, and I've seen people do that. I've seen. I've seen people go on stage to do the band introductions and they're shit faced and they yeah. make themselves look like idiots. Yeah. yeah. Like don't do that. That's not cool. You know, be the cool person. You know, I, I, I always try and be the person that somebody looks forward to on their schedule that day or at the end of the day after, you know, they, you know, in particular like a big festival, you know, where they're doing a lot of press and everything they'll go, Oh, that was a long day. Oh, that Lou guy, he was all right. He had, he had good questions and, you know, he made us laugh and he had, he had stickers of his dog Darla that he gave us. And, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just try and be the, the cool person, the, yeah. the, the coolest person people meet each day. You know, that's, that's yeah. about all you can do. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And working those festivals, that's tough. We do it yeah. quite a bit. Uh, we've mm -hmm. done aftershock for several years and Vans Warped Tour and I've seen some of your stuff and I've seen where you've done like 20 bands in a day. Our strongest day will do, you know, maybe a dozen. And I'm thinking, and I'm wore out and I'm thinking, how does he do it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and, you know, keep that energy up. Yeah. It's just, you know, but again, it, it's, it's another thing where I'll, I'll see. And, and again, I'm not knocking anybody. It just doesn't work for me, but I'll, I'll see, you know, radio friends the night before, uh, you know, rock on the range sonic temple or you know some other festival not fest or something and they're out like slamming shots right and i'm like man that, that'd be like tom brady getting fucked up the night before the super bowl like yeah. don't do that you got to be sharp you got to be awake i you know i try and get sure i got all my notes in order i double check all of my equipment i you know like it, it's not hard work but you've got to make sure that, that everything is set to go. I mean, I often uh, use a, a term, I, I don't think I invented it, but be orderly in your preparation so you may be cha chaotic in your work. You know, mm -hmm. have your shit together so when your work, you can be creative, or if things go crazy, you can roll with the punches, but you can't be creative or roll with the punches if, if you know, you forgot to put batteries in your recorder. Like, right. fuck, yeah. you know? And I've seen that stuff happen. So, oh, you know. yeah. When you're doing that, Lou, how often does shit just come off the top of your head? How often do the questions, like, you have them scripted, but then something better pops in? Is that is that more frequent than the scripted questions or not? Well, I, I, I try not to script questions. I just try and write down uh, subject matter, mm -hmm. um, you know, just short subjects uh, or a name or an idea. Uh because that will help me be more conversational as opposed to just yeah. reading a question. But also, you know, it's, it's like you guys said before we started, 
Uh, it's not an interview, and and, I, and this is what I always say: it's not an interview; it's a conversation. Yeah. And you're not you're not reading a list of questions; you're listening to what the person says, and then basing the next thing you say off what they said. Yeah. And if you prepare for, in this case with me, it tends to be musicians. If you know a lot about their career and then a lot about music in general, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be able to help guide the conversation, but also not be surprised by any avenues it may take. And, uh, you know, for me, before particularly big interviews, I will sometimes lay in bed the night before and run over any possible con uh, combination of questions and conversation. Well, gee, if I ask about this, they might say this. And if they don't like it, they could say this. And if they say this, then I'll prepare to say this. And like, I, I don't know if that makes me crazy or not, well, <laughs> well, I do it but too. that's what I do. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. a lot of times, you know, and people will say, Oh my God, how'd you think of that so quick? And I'm like, uh, cause I ran it over my head 50 times last <laughs> night. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, if you want to, you know, if you want to do something, try and do it as good as you can. And when it comes to interviewing musicians, uh, that's what I found works for me. So yeah, and I, I dig that. I love yeah. it. And I, you do a fantastic job, and you're out there killing it all the time. And this book, I'm so excited! I can't wait to get my hands on it. I wish that we would have gotten a copy uh, prior to our conversation. There's one on its way. Uh, Rare Bird was nice enough to send us one, so we'll be looking forward to that. I'll make sure that we read it from cover to cover, and we'll do a nice review on it. Awesome. And and remember, though, if you I don't know if they're sending you a, a, a finished copy or an advanced reader. The advanced readers don't have the illustrations, and they don't have all the, the elements. I think it's missing the post face and a couple other smaller things. But yeah, I would, I would love to hear what you think of it. Well, if that's the case, then we'll just buy one and have it as well. Well, you know, by me doing this conversation with you, you are now legally obligated to buy 20 copies of the book. <laughs> you well, got it. You, Christmas. So all, Christmas all, gifts. All perfectly legal. Uh, and I just want to give uh, everybody the particulars one more time. Let's do that. Um, so the, the release date for the book is April 14th. The recorded book comes out the same day. The full title of the book is Sonic Warrior, My Life is a Rock and Roll Reprobate, Tales of Sex, Drugs, and Vomiting at Inopportune Moments. Uh, it's from Rare Bird Books. Uh, you can find out more at lubrutus.com. You can also follow along uh, facebook.com. Uh, well, my uh, uh, page is Lou Brutus Rocks. Uh, then for Instagram and Twitter, it's at Lou Brutus. And they're all verified accounts, so they're easy enough to find. And, you know, um, one thing if uh, for folks who pre ordered through Rare Bird, Literally every one of those books, like I think 750 of them, um, they have, they're not only signed, but I've hidden stuff inside every copy. Some are stickers, some are autographed flyers from the postponed book tour. There's uh, initial guitar picks. Some of them, my dog Darla has scrawled her signature in on the front. Um, <laughs> so there's a little something for everybody out there. I'm just really excited for people to finally get it, and I hope it gives them uh uh, the briefest and happiest of breaks from everything going on right now. Yeah, I think it I will. Lou, before we let you go, I have to ask you this. If Sonic Warrior is ever made into a film, who would direct it? Who would play you? And would Darla be featured in it? Uh, oh, of course Darla would be in it because Darla would be pissed if she were not in it. Um, <laughs> who would direct it? There's one particular chapter that I think Cameron Crowe would be the guy to do because the, the, the move, one of the movies closest to my heart is almost famous because I was that kid. My first show was black uh, Sabbath. I, you know, and uh, I, you know, the, 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 the truest scene in that entire film is, um, you know, uh, William Miller, the kid, the interviewer, uh, crying in his room, <laughs> sitting alone in the hallway, uh, unable to get his interview and frustrated and wondering why the hell he's doing this. That's what my life is like. Um, but there's there's one particular chapter on a, a, one of the crazy bands I'm in, the Dead Schembecklers, which is sort of a takeoff on the uh, OSU-Michigan football rivalry. And I'll, I'll leave it for the book. It is the, the craziest chapter in the book. You will read everything that happened to us. You won't believe it. 
but then you can look it up in like the New York Times and the Washington Post. You will see that everything I, I talk about what happened to us in that band is true. That chapter alone should be a standalone film, and I think Cameron Crowe should do it. As for who should play me, um, you know, I think Brad Pitt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why? Why are you laughing? <laughs> because uh, everybody says spot, Brad. Is everybody spot says on. Brad yeah. Pitt. Everybody <laughs> yeah. says Brad Pitt. But but you know, I think Brad Pitt would be a good me. I think everybody else thinks Jack Black would be a better me. <laughs> um, you know, I I don't I don't know. Um, uh, maybe younger me. My daughter thinks that uh, is it Harry Styles. She okay. thinks her style should play me, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Brad Pitt. I, I vote okay, for Brad we'll go with Pitt. Brad Pitt. So, you know. Hey, Lou, thanks again for taking the time to do the show here on Honest Brutality. And I want to do a personal thank you to you. Thanks for keeping me company so many nights on long drives, making me laugh, and helping me to find new music and inspiring me to do what we're doing here. Well, those are very kind words, and I appreciate that very much. And uh, I'm just glad to be part, uh, and you're part of it too. Uh, the two of you are part of the long line of people who present music and try and make the bits of time in between the music interesting or fun or enlightening. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's maybe it's not the most serious job in the world, but but I like it, and I mm -hmm. try and do it well. And uh, it's not a bad way to spend your life on the planet, you know. Yep. Doing what we love. Thank you so much for your time. Well, what did you think of that, Rebel? Oh, he's amazing. I, you know, I love I love the stories that he has. Yeah. And I'm really excited to get my hands on this book. And I love that, you know, it's not just one full continuous book. I love the chapters. I love the chapter titles are so damn long. And funny. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's such a funny guy. Yeah, totally. It, this was a really big deal for me because mm -hmm. uh, Lou really was one of the inspirations for starting this. You know, right. I had I had inspirations being a drummer. Yep. I had inspirations for a lot of things. And when we started this show, I'll have to go back in the archives and find it. And I think it's one of the ones that's not even available on our um, in our platform anymore. Right. One of our very, very first episodes, I had made the comment of, wouldn't it be cool if we got Lou Brutus to do this show with us? Yeah. And so that was a really cool moment for me. And again, thank you, Lou, so much for doing the show. Everybody go out and check out his book, Sonic Warrior. And I'm not reading the whole damn title. It's just crazy. It's <laughs> Sonic Warrior by Lou Brutus, Rare Bird Books. Go check it out. Available April 14th. By the time you hear this, it might be out and ready to go. And look for him to come out and do the signings. Once everything clears up, yeah. he'll be out and doing that in person. Thanks again for listening to Honest Brutality. If you want to reach out to us, you can hit us up on our socials, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Do us a favor and wherever you're listening to the podcast, go leave us a rating and a review. It doesn't matter what you say. It just helps other people find our show. Check us out every Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific on Rock Rage Radio. Just Google it. You'll find it. You can listen on the web or listen to it on TuneIn, or any of your other favorite digital radio apps. In the meantime, be good people, take care of one another, and most importantly, stay metal! Stay metal!